After looking into the probable origins of fleas and flint, both present in the chain worn by all its members, we look now at a third symbol connected to the Order of the Golden Fleece, founded by Philip the Good, Duke of Burgundy, halfway the 15th century. Although not as prominent as the fleece and the flint, the pheasant also connects once more to the Colchian regions, to Asia Minor and beyond, and here is how. During his 30 years as the Grand Master of the Order, Philip called his knights to a gathering eleven times, which is more than any of the succeeding Grand Masters ever did. The Western world was in turmoil. Decennia of treason and war had left Europe uh, devastated. Philip needed to consolidate his knights around himself and uh, to build strong allegiances. He did so by calling for assemblies all over the Burgundian territory. The very first chapter of the Knights of the Order of the Golden Fleece must have been a spectacle. The event was recorded by historians of the time and is now known to this day as the Banquet of the Pheasant. This chapter took place in Réseau, Lille in French, which was back then one of the major Flemish cities, currently though within uh, French borders. There, Philips bound his knights by oath. The festivities lasted several weeks and no expense was spared. Chroniclers make mention of an extravagant grandeur and splendor, of the best wines flowing out of elaborately made constructions, of automatons fabricated for the occasion and of exotic animals on permanent display. It was a summon of Burgundian plentitude, with a decadence in food and drink, with constant spectacle being performed, among which a play on the life of Jason and his Argonauts. At a certain point, an elephant was led into the main hall by a Saracen, on which a young woman was seated. She allegorically represented the Roman Catholic Church, asking to be freed from Islamic oppression by the nobles. Following to this theatrical call for action, a dish with a pheasant was brought forth. The neck of the animal was adorned with gold, pearls and rubies. In its entirety, the feast lasted for 18 days. So the knights took their oath upon this royal bird to defend the Roman Catholic Church with their lives and to go on a crusade, as had done their ancestors the centuries before that. They vowed to uphold the virtuous life of chivalry, as Philip of Burgundy asked of his brother, brethren. <clears throat> To Philip, raised in a family that was all about crusades, to free the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem was to him an ideal he upheld his whole life long. It was the main reason for the founding of the Order, although it eventually never happened during his lifetime, Philip used his knights for the cohesion of his duchy and for the international uh, diplomacy. Looking for an origin of this vow on the pheasant, I could not find many at all. Knightly vows may be based on a Norse tradition, but the Norse saga only speaks of vows over game and generally that will be boars. I eventually found five historical or at least semi-historical semi uh, instances of these vows on birds, knightly vows on birds. I say semi-historical because three of four, three out of four are liter literary sources placed in a historical context. Next to the vow on the pheasant in 1454, 
There is a vow on the swans taken in Westminster at the court of Edward I over a uh, century earlier in 1306, where Edward, Edward knighted over 300 men that day, all uh, of which all took the vows. The literary sources are the vow on the peacock, the vow on the heron, and the vow on the sparrow hawk. A 15th century manuscript with ep with an epic poem called Le Vue uh, du Paon, or The Oath of the Peacock, written by Jacques de Longuillon of Lorraine, was based on the vow of, of, on the swans by Edward I and probably served as an example to Philip. It is considered a fictional piece. Uh, but what is interesting is that it is the man that it is this manuscript that introduced the concepts of the nine worthies or the nine va valiants. These ideals are, are represented by nine so-called historical figures: three pagans, three Jews, and three Christians, who personified the ideals of knighthood. Alexander the Great. Charlemagne and Julius Caesar are three examples. They embodied the ideals of chivalry. The lives of these, of these persons needed to be studied and their virtues applied by those who aspired to become a knight. There was also a female counterpart to this. Curiously, with the Assyrian Semiramis, Penthesilea, the Amazon queen, and Tomiris, Queen of the Steps, among the nine heroines. Lots of interesting details to add here, I'm sure, but like I said, the poem is considered fiction. Let's return to the real thing instead, this banquet of Philips the Good, to whom the noble virtues of chivalry and the intention uh, to reconquer Constantinople were essential in the code of conduct he demanded from his knights. So the Burgundians chose the pheasant, not the peacock nor the swans. Pheasants did not occur in Western Europe. They only seemed to have found their way into the Balkan and the Caucasus. They were, uh, early it is assumed, that they were imported into South uh, Europe from Asia Minor by the Romans. During the Middle Ages, Western European nobles would breed pheasants, also rabbits by the way, uh, which are also not native to Western Europe. Hares are, but not rabbits. And these nobles would hunt them then during exclusive hunting parties. That is probably how these animals eventually spread here to become quite common. The bird's name in Latin is Fasianus colchicus. Colchicus, of course, meaning from colches. The name Fasianus refers to the hydronym Fasus and as far as I have researched now, it is still unclear to which river this name belongs. Some assume it to be the river that led Jason and his Argonauts further eastwards. Others claim this river got its name because of the pheasant being transported into Greece from the Caspian. Some say it is located in the northeast of the Black Sea uh, coastline. Others stick to a more southern location, and as it so goes with many of, if not all, rivers, its bed changed a lot over time, making it even more difficult to locate. Description passed on and first written down by Herodotus, the delta where the river Phasis flows into the Black Sea could underline this identification with the Rioni River. Um, located in ancient cultures. Also Strabo basing his conclusions partially on information available through the scribes of Mithradates the sixth 
Eupater of Pontus places the river fosses in ancient cultures. Hippocrates describes the delta region as a swampy wetland uh, through which a shallow river slowly moves and in which the population on which the population lives among the reeds using dugout canoes to move around. This all raises the question whether Philip the Burgundian in his time saw a connection there with the wetlands of western Flanders in which, in which Bruges was located. The mere name Flanders stems from Roman flan meaning mud. Before the coastline shifted, many Flemish lived in stilt houses. But just like many renowned historians of antiquity, Maybe Philip also solely relied on the descriptions left by others, that these descriptions often watered down in accuracy, feeding myth and fables, cannot be assigned to or blamed on anyone. Like I said, there are other locations given for the mythical river, descriptions which identify the river with the Araxes, the Kura, the lower part of the Don, back then named Tanais, and in the east, the Amudaria or Oxus River. Phasus also appears as the name of a settlement founded on its banks around the 8th century BC by Milesian Greeks. You see, the difficulty is that no trace of, the def of this settlement has been found to this day. It is also assumed that the bay that this settlement Phasus was located in currently lies under sea level, buried by alluvial mud after landslides. Now this settlement Phasus was an emporion, which is a Latin term for trading place or repository of ware goods. So how important was this trade hub during that time in history? If it was indeed an emporium, then what trade took place there? Gold, maybe, caught in the skin of sheep in the Colchian highlands. I mean, it had uh, to be something that was imported there from somewhere else, since the region itself had very little to offer. See part one for more on the gold. Maybe. Uh, on the other hand, it was Lapis Lazuli, <laughs> next to Amber, one of the earliest trading goods ever, imported from Badakhshan in Afghanistan. Is it a coincidence that the Europeans finally learned the fabrication of aquamarine pigments, for which this mineral is needed, only after the establishment of trade with the regions east of the Black Sea in the Middle Ages? Aquamarine that from then on was so eagerly used in the beautiful medieval miniatures that decorated their handwritten manuscripts. Due to lack of archaeological and literary sources, however, it long has been a matter of dispute whether the region was connected to the Silk Road and whether it was of international importance in that sense. There is a difficult to cross mountain range towards the east and only very few artifacts were found that attest the early Greeks going any further at this latitude. Nevertheless, although few in number, they are there. A re-examination of the literary sources does seem to suggest for the possibility of a northern trade route connecting the Black Sea with the Caspian Sea through, the, through Azerbaijan and Armenia, and via the Oxus River tributaries all the way to the north of India, current Pakistan. There is also record of the West Parthians and even the Sassanids being parti particularly interested in this Caucasian region during the, the first millennium. But they never got or maintained a steady foothold in the Caucasus. Now, let's return to the birds. Pheasants are originally from Asia, where still many different kinds can be found, one being more fabulous looking than the other, 
notice some of the species even have feathers that resemble those of the peacock. Research almost seems to indicate a role of humanity in the spreading of this semi-domesticated bird towards the West during the past millennia and not only uh, here in Europe. The possible connection with the Parthians, for example, and other Central Asian cultures is underlined by the appearance of a mythical bird in their mythology. Yeah, of course, birds are legion and creation mythology all around the world, but let's stick more or less to Central Asia. As to be expected, we see a certain overlap, a certain syncretism, which leaves, which shows connection, in my opinion, to our pheasant. In Asia Minor, we find the bird Shamrosh. Uh, sometimes accompanied by Amrosh, his female, which is often left out of the stories. Some say its story stems from Hittite mythology. Um, Shamrosh lives in the near of the primordial ocean, ocean and it is responsible for, for spreading seeds all over the world. This particular trait makes a clear distinction between this and other mythical birds in that it indicates that Chamarosh is a plant eater rather than being a predatory bird like Ziz from Hebrew mythology, Garuda from uh, Buddhist mythology or Hindu mythology and rock and uh, so many others. Already in pre-Persian mythology we find the Huma bird and the Simurgh which was said to be as fabulous as the phoenix. Every 500 years it would burn itself up from its ashes to resurrect. Of the Huma bird it is said that it has no legs and it is therefore always flying above the world, invisible to the eyes of men. So maybe it is in the stars. Like the Simurgh, it is a kingmaker, sometimes something which will find its way into Indian poetry, presumably as a consequence of the Mughal invasion. Also in the Southeast Asian region, such a mythical bird appears, called the Feng Huang. And uh, Feng Huang is uh, present in South Korea and Japan also. And some will firmly state that the Feng Huang bird has been introduced by members of a Saka, aka Eastern Parchan Brotherhood. So, yeah, there is in all these stories uh, uh, an overlap connecting Shamrosh with, uh, from Anatolia with the Persian Simurgh and the others. And while some undoubtedly will reject the idea of the Colchian pheasant, which they see as an ennobled chicken, with the fabulous bird phoenix or the impressive Simurgh, I personally do see traces of its appearance in artwork of uh, Central Asia that um, underline this. Whether Phillips chose this this Colchian bird because of the connection to the Colchian ramskin or simply because of its golden feathers and and, it ex, and its exclusiveness, I don't know for sure. He grew up in a house so that baited in crusade tradition. Both his grandfather and father were crusaders in their time. And Philip is said to have had a lifelong interest in the Eastern Mediterranean history and tradition. This is, a, this is attested by the many copies in his personal library of works from that region. Uh, one could ask, for example, why Philip did not simply copy the Edwardian uh, vow on the swans. And, yeah, maybe this is because of the Hussites, uh, the Czechian followers of heathen Christian John Hus uh, used the emblem of the swan, and the Hussites had won the first war against the Catholic Knights 
on their crusades against them in 1420, that is during the lifetime of um, this uh, Philip of Burgundy. Um, yeah, it all remains very unclear. And I know my search is based on intuition, on loose ends, on circumstantial evidence or even on speculation, if you will. But there is more I want to share connecting to all this um, when and if time and circumstances allow, of course. 